Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the Environment of Bargaining, Chapter 8. All the process up to now has given the union the right to bargain. The union to sit across the table from the company and expect um, uh, bargaining in good faith, things we've talked about. So now we need to talk about, put yourself in that process. What's going to happen? Uh, what are the regulations? What are the rules? What's the policy that I need to follow from both sides, either the, the union or the corporation in this bargaining process? There are three basic components to every contract. There are three basic components to bargaining. Three basic components. The first one is mandatory bargaining issues. These things have to be in the contract as established by law. These are things like wages and working conditions. They have to be mentioned in the contract. You cannot have a contract and not mention wage. It's not a contract. It's not a legal enforceable entity. So these, these mandatory issues, both sides know what they are. Now they'll fuss and fight about that. We'll argue about the wage issue and the policies and all that all day long, but wages will be mentioned in there. And other terms and conditions of employment, mandatory. The second thing that you can have in this bargaining agreement are called permissive issues. Permissive issues. These are things that are allowed but do not have to be there. Uh, an example of a permissive, perm permissive issue is that the union would say, we'd like to be involved in the pricing of this product. We'd like to put it in the contract that we will be involved in the process. We will have a vote in the pricing of this product. Uh, we feel that that affects our ability to work, our ability to receive pay, so we will be involved in that pricing decision. And that is a permissive type of issue that can go into a contract. The third thing is called a prohibitive issue. Prohibited issue, prohibited issue. So these are things that are, as it just says, are prohibited. You can't have them in there. Uh, the union tried to put things in there like, this company can only buy raw materials from companies that are unionized. That is, that is prohibited. You cannot do that. That is affecting free trade. Uh, that breaks all kind of legal issues in this country. So the union cannot come in and do that. We can't even argue about that. So the three issues that are brought up, mandatory, permissive, and prohibited in every contract that you will see. Both sides know these issues. Both sides know that you, these are the things that are mandatory. They have to be in there. These are the things that cannot be in there. And in anything else, we can fuss and fight about all day long. There are environmental pressures that affect the bargaining process on both sides. These are, these are external forces that push down on this bargaining process and would make the union or the company either more agreeable to focus on something or disagreeable to focus on something. Uh, so it all depends. It all depends on what kind of environment you're doing this with and at what time in history you're trying to arrange this contract uh, that has a great effect on the outcome of this contract. So what do y'all think about that? The first one, there's a long list, so I apologize for that. The first one is public policy. What are the rules what are the public laws? Anytime you hear the word public policy, that's what it means. Public policy is law, and it just should say that. I used to go, public policy, what in the world is that? That's law, that is law. So public policy deals with the fact that you have, a lot of industries have very concentrated power. So there's public policy that says these, industry, these industries cannot get together and collude they can't get together and decide pricing situations. 
they also can't get together and say, hey, we're going to negotiate as this group unless we've decided to do that and have told the NLRB we're going to do that. Uh, so public policy tries to make it even for everybody so there can't be any collusion and there can't be any power play. Number two, competition and concentration in markets. A lot of these markets have very concentrated industrial groups. Um, you don't have hundreds of companies that produce this product. You'll have three. Three major companies that produce this product. So the fact that you do have this concentration means that there can be some collaboration. Even though you're not supposed to collude, it's real hard sometimes to tell when collusions happen or not. And if you've only got two or three major players, it's real hard to be able to say, well, they got together and talked. Well, they didn't really have to. There's only three players. I can find out exactly what the price is and what the demand is and what the employment situation is. Um, and so it makes it real easy for these companies to find out what other companies are doing so that you can kind of have this quasi-unified front, even though it's not, can't be proven in court that you colluded. Number three, regulation and deregulation. There are regulations all over the place. When I was in the banking industry for 12 years, the government would tell us, this is the most you can charge for a loan, and this is the highest rate of interest you can pay to a customer. And it was across the board. So me and my competitor across the street, when we made a loan, I knew exactly what rate he was charging. That's price. Pricing was regulated. Costs were regulated. When I made, gave somebody a CD, when I begged them to bring me money, the cost that I could charge them was set by the government, but it was the same cost the guy across the street could charge. So it was real easy. So if you think about it, back in the day, I couldn't say, come deposit your money with my bank because I can give you a better rate than he can. So because we couldn't do that, I would say, come and open up a savings account and I'll give you a toaster or a pot holder. We used to give away pot holders as a prize to entice you to come and put your money in my bank because I could not pay you one penny more than he could pay you. So that was heavy regulation. Well, nowadays we have no regulation in banks. That's what happened in 2008, 2009. I don't care what they say, I was there. It got crazy. Um, deregulation made people, you basically let the foxes guard the hen house. So I'm not, I'm not, subscribing to regulation or deregulation right now. What I'm saying is the industry you're in, whether it's regulated or deregulated, gives you the freedom or the restrictions of behavior. And, and certainly in dealing with negotiations with a union, uh, it will certainly impact your economic position and your power structure. Number four, global competition. We know that, we've been preaching this for years. Uh, almost so much that nobody even hears about it anymore. But we don't just compete with North Carolina anymore. We don't compete with people in Augusta anymore. We compete with people in Paris and in London and in Star Lobodna over in Slovakia. That's who we're dealing with. That's our now, that's now our market. It's almost as easy to get it to London as it is to get it to Columbia. In fact, it's just as easy. It might cost a little more. So technology has made it so that markets are just, market borders have just disintegrated. We really don't have them anymore. And so we can't just fight against, I mean, just say, well, North Carolina is our issue. So when the union and the, and the company are negotiating, I can't say anymore, well, you know, we're doing, we're doing, we're shipping overseas and it's just costing us so much. I really can't say that anymore. Uh, that might be true. But the cost is down and the union's going, we don't want that to happen. We don't want there to be this kind of globalization. The unions don't really like globalization. Um, but I'm saying, yes, we've got that. I can put a plant in Germany. I can start building it over there. And the union does not go with it. I have to deal with the union laws in Germany, but the union laws in the United States do not work over there. They have no jurisdiction. 
Uh, so globalization gives either the union or the company the upper hand, depending on how they play that uh, in these negotiations. Labor force demographics, uh, they are changing. Um, obviously, we have a lot more women in the workforce, as we should. Uh, hopefully, we have, we're open the workforce to minorities and to other groups, uh, handicapped, what the age, um, that are allowing people to work because of their ability, as it should be. However, this causes a completely different demographic and a different need focus from members of the union. So members of the union, let's say they're now more female, um, their focus and their issues might be totally different than the, their male issues uh, of the past uh, or of the minority issues of the past. And so the unions have become much more diverse through these demographics and that makes now uh, negotiation with the company a lot more difficult because these different demographic groups have different needs and different desires. So it's not as unified as we used to think that it was. Change in consumer demand, the last one. Um, we want different things. Uh, in particular, Lee, in the areas of production, product, or service. We don't make a whole lot of stuff anymore. That's a sad thing. It's trying to come back. It truly is. Uh, GE has decided to build plants in the United States in the next 10 years versus the plants that we're going to build in other areas of the world. Good for GE. Uh, so it's coming back. That means the employment will come back, etc. cetera. Um, but consumer demand is to the point now where the higher consumer demand is in services, not so much product. And that's kind of why we moved to a service-focused uh, uh, economy in, this, in the United States. Uh, we provide great service. We provide technological service. We provide communication service. We provide financial service. All these great service things. And we've let the rest of the world make, produce these things because that's harder. Or that's however you want to look at it. Um, that's really caused a, a differentiation in consumer demand because what we demand now are these service activities. Um, and so service quality people, at first it was like, well, this is low tech. These are low skilled people. These are people that just answer the phone and fill in an order. But technology has driven that service kind of industries have a high high tech and a high low tech need of employees. Um, so, it all depends on which one of those you use in your company, which one of those your union needs to produce that product. Uh, so these things uh, create a negotiating issue. Uh, and again, it all depends. One time it will be in favor of the union, the opposite will be in favor of the company. Uh, so you have to look at what that consumer demand is and how is it how is it affected the need for employment at that particular institution. So we have looked at the environment of bargaining, the things that take place when the bargaining sits down. When you pull the chair up to the table, what's going to be going on? What are the issues that you're going to look at? And we've looked at those issues. Uh, and I, again, this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you've got a text that explains this in great detail. These are just things that you really want to focus on um, because, you know, that's, again, the tip of the iceberg. At least I can identify the iceberg. Um, but this is not the end of the story, and you certainly need to go back to your text and find out uh, more detail about all of these issues. Y'all have a great night. Peace.